my name is Stephanie. Um, I'm a first year PhD student from Museum Southeast Denmark and the University of Copenhagen. I want to start out by thanking you, Kiara, for having this session. I think it's so relevant and I'm super happy to be here. Um, my research is conducted within a larger VLOX funded project named the Timeline Applied Archaeology in Kuno. And I mainly concern myself with development-led archaeology and its effect on society. Um, today, I want to reflect upon the topic of archaeological engagement within a process as a practice of activist action. My theories and claims today are inspired partly by a citizen science project conducted by Anna Beck, who is managing the project I'm hired at, and partly by literary inspiration. Um, I will start out by giving you a very short introduction to the framework of our project before discussing the broad possibilities of archaeological activism. So the background of our project is found in development-led archaeology, which in Denmark is carried out at the museums. Um, each year, a larger number of excavations are conducted to secure data and knowledge due to rapid modern uh, development. The consequence is a large collection of archaeological data, which unfortunately most often ends up in report and magazines without being published, researched further into or otherwise put into any use. Therefore, the concept of cultural heritage as a value uh, was implemented in 2011 as a means to encourage the museums in dialogue with the developer to disseminate the archaeological results in a way that the developer finds relevant as well. And the fact, uh, despite a few good examples, this has not successfully been implemented in our development-led excavation practice in Denmark. Moreover, we're struggling with increasing political awareness and questioning of the relevance of development-led archaeology. And somehow, both of these situations are born out of the same problem that archaeological excavation are not seen as an active resource for modern society. Wait, this moved a bit. <laughs> to this problem, we can add the aim with the Danish Museum legal legislation to produce significant new knowledge. The knowledge and its significant significance is defined by synchronous and chron chronological events in time. Put in other words, significant new knowledge is defined as the gaps in our archaeological knowledge about specific time periods, leaving out many other kinds of knowledge, knowledge such as theme-based knowledge across periods. Furthermore, it disregards the knowledge produced within an archaeological process, including the sentient engagement with archaeological remains, and it also leaves out the opportunity for speculative, creative, and thought-provoking reflections on time. It's going to be fun to see how my PowerPoint looks today. <laughs> Apparently something happened to it. Well, let's see. Um, this leads to an increased focus on the past, leaving out present processes in which the archaeological excavation takes place. Um, this creates an artificial distance between the past that we investigate and the present in which the excavation takes place. This becomes an obstacle later in the process when trying to argue for the relevance of archaeology within modern society. But what if we saw the present context as a transformative process from where questions could be asked, making the excavation itself relevant for the local community surrounding it? This approach is something that we're ex experimenting with in Cunois through actively engaging local citizens in our practice. I would therefore like you to think of Cunois as a laboratory from where we're able to experiment with developing different methods and approaches to expanding our archaeological practice. For those of you that doesn't know or don't know where Cunois is, it's located on Sealand. Uh, 40 minutes south of Copenhagen, with a large coastal area facing towards Ørsund. Right now, this area consisting of a detached housing area and a village divided by a large highway and a tra train station is undergoing urban renewal. 
The village is being rebuilt into a new neighborhood with up to 1,600 new homes with a focus on green living, sustainability, and communal, spir communal spirit across generations. Um, this has led to large-scale excavations, getting close to 450 hectares being investigated over the last 20 years, leaving us with an abundant archaeological record stretching from the Neolithic to the present. Most excavations are done on behalf of one developer, the City Sap Council of Kyu, um, simplifying the process of our archaeological work within the area. With a communal project of this size, the City Council of Kyu have worked out a common master plan for the transformation of the area with explicit ideas behind the neighborhood, emphasizing the before mentioned green living and sustainability, and adding to this um, diversity, communal sense, and an active cultural urban spaces. Furthermore, and to our advance, they have an, an enhanced focus on culture and sports. We have identified a number of challenges, challenges within the plan that we're able to contrib contribute to archaeologically. Firstly, we aim to identify the actual meaning of the term communal sense. The word can easily become a very empty buzzword that's, that does not actually apply to the given situation. Secondly, we're working with the transformative landscape in Crinois. How do the transformative processes reflect the understanding and active engagement with the landscape, and how is the archaeology reflected in the landscape? Lastly, the City Council wants the area to be gathered, sharing school, library, and shops. However, this might be a challenge since the area is physically divided uh, by both the large highway crossing it and the train lines. Um, and there is only a few crossing pass passages between the two areas. Um, based on these challenges, we're working with three main themes in our project. We're working with communal sense using archaeology as a connection maker. We're working with time presenting the time depth to the inhabitants of the area with a focus on not only past happenings, but also what is happening right now in the present. And we're working with change through the two first mentioned uh, themes. We can create a space for mirroring, thinking about and understanding changes in a wider perspective, inviting the inhabitants to express their feelings towards the changes happening right now. Thus, our archaeological contribution is practiced through actively engaging in the local community. Um, I read an article that inspired me to look at our three themes through the lens of process archaeology. Much like the rationale behind seeing a transition from Mesolithic to Neolithic cultures as a process of change, and adaption, it makes sense to me at least to look at this transformation happening in Cunor right now as a process of change that we can deal with archaeologically. It's a patchwork of interrelated happenings. To fully understand this process and how it affects society, we find it necessary to engage with the people experiencing the state of becoming, the transition from something that was to something that is leading further to something that is not yet. This engagement with living people can seem quite scary to an archaeologist like me, who's mainly been taught to deal with dead people or to interact professionally with living people through the dissemination of already established knowledge. But I would like to look at this engagement as a process too. It's a learning process for me as an archaeologist to reconsider what I think I know about change um, and to reconsider my role as an archaeologist. I might be more useful as a custodian of spaces for discussion, reflection, and remembrance upon abstract topics than a disseminator of already established knowledge. This form of engagement is one of the applied methods that I exper experiment with in my research. A short and very broad uh, outlining of applied archaeology is defined by Stottmann as the application of archaeological research methods and theory to assist the public in addressing societal problems and issues. To this, I would like to add that I do not work with the public as a fixed term defining all non-archaeologists in Denmark. Um, I find it more useful to replace the public with local community. 
Going further from Stottmann's applied archaeology, I have recently discovered the term engaged archaeology, which might actually be an even broader uh, term than applied archaeology, but combining these two approaches is what leads me to reflect on activism. Engaged archaeology works with the fr within the framework of process archaeology as well. Furthermore, archaeological engagement is shaped by the social and political, cons political concerns of the people with whom archaeologists intersect. Put in other words, engaged archaeology differs depending on situations within processes of change. Smith and Ralph defined, uh, define engaged archaeology by three characteristics. It actually uh, it actively engages with the social, cultural, and political dimensions of the lives of the people with whom archaeologists works. Secondly, it's shaped by the community's wishes. And lastly, it aims to make a practical difference to people's lives. Working with engaged archaeology, we had found that the act of doing something physical while thinking, talking, and remembering, engaging in a social process of knowledge sharing, might entail new understanding or actual new knowledge. As archaeologists, we're used to creating conscious, explorative, and directly sensible contact with our research material. We think with our objects, with our surroundings, and with our bodily working practices. This is how we as archaeologists understand our objects of research. So why not bring this bodily engagement into our dissemination practice as well? So far, we have experimented with actively engaging the citizens in Kurnoa in shared knowledge production and dissemination through citizen science projects. Anna has worked with the method Walking and Talking as a follow-up to ma uh, a mapping project of the detached housing area conducted with local citizens from both sides of the highway. During a two-hour Sunday walk, uh, walk in the detached housing area, Anna took the lead in disseminating the stories that the citizens told in relation to mapping the area. But more importantly, the word was open to whoever wanted to join in with personal stories. The direct interaction with the landscape and each other evoked memories for a lot of the participators. They were given a space in which they were the experts of their own stories, and this created a space for them to reflect openly upon the changes that happened in the area. For some, um, these changes have been experienced since they were kids, because they grew up there. Um, through actively engaging ourselves with the local community in which we work, we've made small successes with starting knowledge-producing processes, involving different narratives that are not prefixed. Furthermore, we have actively been working on breaking down the knowledge hierarchy that often exists within the heritage dissemination through walking and talking and active engagement with the citizens and our surroundings. Next year, I will explore this uh, these methods further, replacing the walking with excavating, another citizen science project, um, where I will be inviting local citizens in uh, to excavate a trench in their own gardens. I hope this will spike interest in conversations and hopefully act as both a space for the citizens to discuss our main, main topics, time change and communal sense. But I also, um, but I also hope to understand the process of bodily engagement with our heritage and the following knowledge production better through this project. I will now try to wrap up my thoughts on processes, engagement and activism. First of all, one might ask how is taking a walk on a Sunday with a bunch of people from Kurinoa an activist action? I argue that activism can be applied in our archaeological practice on different levels. Activism in this case might be best described as an applied archaeological method entailing micro-impacts on a local community. There are no specific or highly problematized political issues at stake in Kuinoa. It's a very common Danish place and the majority of the people living there are also what you might define as very common Danish families. But these common places are probably what we are surrounded by most often as archaeologists, um, especially us working with development at archaeology. And exactly therefore, I think that this is a highly relevant topic. 
I argue that activist archaeology is relevant not only in urgent political or ethical heritage issues, but also in what we might define as the everyday life of normal pe people living in normal places. I now want to stress that I'm not suggesting that we add problems to non-problematic topics. Rather, I'm suggesting that activist archaeology is not only useful for engaging in communities and making some sort of change, but also for reflecting upon our own practice and our role as archaeologists. Um, activism can also be about staying with the change, which is sometimes troubling, as Caitlin De Silvi said on Thursday afternoon. Um, it can also be about taking a situated choice regarding how and why we conduct and disseminate our research. It is about what we teach our students in the classroom, and it is about how we choose to engage ourselves in society as archaeologists. To me, there are many ways to be an activist, and I think that these micro-impacts might be important um, in the aim of expanding our practice within development-led archaeology. If we're able to work with these micro-impacts as part of our development-led uh, excavation practice, we might stand stronger in our contribution to society. That was it for me. <laughs>